Today on the show, we have Doug Winston. His company is called DNM Electrical Contracting Inc. They are an electrical and utility construction company in niche markets. So Doug, thanks for being on the show today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So we were just talking about a pivotal moment in your life. It all starts in the beginning. I mean, I was 17 years old, getting ready to graduate from school. Everybody was picking what college they were going to. I was told by my mother, well, you're going to college. And she would say, what do you want to go to college for? I'm like, I don't know. You know, she would probe and probe, well, what do you want to do for a living? And every time I came up with something, she'd say, that's a hobby. That's not a career. And I was really pretty lost. I mean, the only thing I really knew is I was into stuff, into electrical. I, I put stereos in all my friends' cars and always tinkered with radios and things of that nature. So I, I kind of thought I would do something electrical in nature, but really didn't even know what was out there. So the senior year, I'm probably about a month from graduating and I went to Catholic school, guidance counselor was a nun, I had to go see her before I could graduate. She comes over and she picks up my folder and she goes, let's see, Mr. Winston, what do we have here? You're going to Westchester Community College for Electrical Engineering Technology. She goes, what kind of a bullshit course is that? I'm like, excuse me, sister? And she goes, what gives here? Why aren't you taking engineering? I'm like, I don't want to be an engineer. She goes, why? I go, I hate math. I don't want to sit behind a desk. It's just not, that's not my thing. She's like, wow, you could be a field engineer. I'm like, I, I can't envision doing four years of school of math and engineering. It just doesn't appeal to me. So she starts like drilling down. I'm like, well, what do you like to do? What do you do when you leave here today? So I'm going over to John Carrillo's house to help him put the new stereo in that 68 Cougar he's building. She goes, you like to work with your hands? I said, yeah, yeah. She goes, do you ever think about being an electrician? I'm like, no, nah, I don't want a blue collar job. She goes, you just told me you don't want to be an engineer. You don't want to sit behind a desk. I'm like, yeah, well, she goes, don't you have any relatives that are electricians? I says, well, yeah, my cousin, I, I think he owns his own business. She goes, he does. Yeah. She goes, well, you're going to go home and you're going to call him and ask him if you can work for him this summer. I'm like, oh, she's like, you realize it's a great opportunity for electricians down there. They're, they're, the union's taking in double the size classes, construction's booming. The economy's great. This was 1986. So uh, I start thinking about it and I'm like, okay, I really don't have a direction here. I go home and I tell my mother. And she says, I says, eh, my guidance counselor says, I, I, I should call Al and see if I can work for him for the summer. And she goes, oh, that's good. She thinks it'll help you in college. And I go, yeah, that's it. So uh, a little meeting gets set up and my grandfather says, come on, I'll take you over to Al's house. And we call Al and he says, don't meet me at my old house. Meet me at my new house. I said, oh, yeah, the house you built in Tuckahoe. He goes, well, that's my old house. I built a new house in Scarsdale. I built a new house. This guy's 32 years old. Drive to his new house. We sit down. He hasn't even moved in yet. He goes, what do you think? And I'm looking around. Three thousand square foot center hall colonial in the middle of the neighborhood that, like, can't even envision living in when you were a kid. And I'm like, it's pretty nice. He goes, Yeah, I got no mortgage. You have no mortgage? He goes, Yeah. Sold the house in Tuckahoe. I bought this lot for cash. There was a house in the middle. I knocked it down. It was actually on two lots, subdivided. Sold the other lot off. So I got this lot for free. Now I just built my house. Sold my old house. I got no mortgage. And I'm like, ah, blown away. So then. All right, well, tell me about what an electrician does. And he starts telling me about it. We do stores, we do houses, we do this, we do this. We, these are the tools we use. This is what we do. And I, I pretty much at that point, I walked out of there that day and said, I want to be an electrical contractor. That's what I want to do. So I have to be an electrician first. I got to work for seven years. Then I got to get a license and then I can open my own business. I pretty much executed on that plan. I worked for him for about, about five years, worked for somebody else for another two I needed some more experience in other areas. I wanted to do more heavier commercial and industrial work, which I liked. And I did it. This month, we celebrate our 30th anniversary. So a lot happened since then in between. But yeah, that's probably the pivotal moment that kind of got me in the direction I'm in now. Yeah, it's an amazing story. I mean, he definitely, your cousin sold a picture there. He's like, oh, 32, just built my home. <laughs> like, Yeah, I mean, it was, it was kind of hard to, you know, you just look at him like, well, I think I got some direction. Yeah, okay. So yeah. Yeah, pretty good moment. So over 30 years of building this business, yeah, is, has there been some key struggles that stand out to you that you've had to overcome? Always. Twice I can recall the thought of maybe we're going to have to go bankrupt. We had a pretty big job around 2000 and 
did work at a nuclear power plant and the contractor that we were working with was having some difficulties and they owed us a lot of money. And I was really nervous that they weren't going to be able to pay us. You get that idea in your head and you go, well, it's always an option, but then you kind of go back to now that never surrender mentality. And, and I'll be honest with you, the never surrender mentality comes from me at 19 years old. I was diagnosed with stage three testicular cancer. I was lucky prior to me, the cure rate was about 1%. I was number 187. 186 people were tried in clinical trials on a new protocol of chemotherapy and surgery. After me, the cure rate was 99%. And, you know, cancer had spread pretty extensively through my body. It was all the way up to my heart. I probably didn't envision how bad it was. And maybe they didn't let me know. But I remember week nine, and it was the last day of the last treatment. And I was so sick. And for a second, this voice in my head said, man, maybe I'd be better off dead. And then the other little voice on my shoulder said, don't you dare say that. Don't you ever give up. And I think I've heard that voice a few times over the years. And that was one of them. So contemplating bankruptcy, I kind of like put back in that moment saying, don't you dare think about quitting. I was able to go in with the customer and get our money paid because he was being held up, not by anything he did, not by anything I did, but it turns out that the, there was a third party we were dealing with, they were manufacturers of the equipment that we had installed. And I was able to prove that their equipment was defective and that all the additional costs were their fault. And then once I flushed that out, they were actually apologetic, paid us and said, Hey, you did a really good job of documenting what happened here. The most frightening part of it, when you realize how close you were, was about two months later, I was reading the newspaper back when people read newspapers and in the legal notices, I saw that that customer that we were working for went bankrupt and uh, you look and you go, we were that close. And there's a, there's a thing in bankruptcy where they can call back checks that were issued back to a certain point immediately. I know that and I'm counting in my head, like how long ago did we get that check? How long did we get the check? Well, it was beyond the point of where that check could be called back. But again, another moment where you look and you go, we were that close. So uh, that always stands out in my mind. I, I always hear the discussions about being uncomfortable and you need to be uncomfortable to grow. And there's truth to that, but you need to have a level of comfort in knowing that you're in a position to take on more risk. Otherwise you're just being risk reckless. I can't tell you how many people have come and gone in my industry that all come in and kind of like make a comment to you as to saying you're, you're very conservative the way you run things mm, okay i don't see it that way but that's fine you go online and you look at all these people are rah, rah, business consultants i'm a consultant okay what have you done well i worked for this company well, what'd you do did you ever make any money how much money did you make well yeah well yeah, that company was actually wasn't i wasn't in a position to do this but now because i could see what should have been done in that company now i could tell you how to run your company Okay, that's great. So what are you going to do for me? Oh, we can increase your sales by 300%. So what? Increasing sales doesn't mean you're going to make money. Where's profit margin? Where's the resources coming from? You're going to lend me the money? What money? The money. You don't increase sales 300% without an increase in cash flow. Where's that money coming from? You lending it to me? What's the interest rate? What's your VIG on the deal? And they just kind of look at you like, huh? I've never let us get into a position where We've overextended ourselves, but we've had times, and again, where you get into a situation where maybe a job creeps and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's bigger than what you want it to do. And you know what? Luckily, they've always worked out to a point where we've landed on our feet and we've made money and we got out of it alive. But there's a lot of times where you're looking and you go, if we don't get paid this money, we could be out of business. And, and you know what, it, it just, in the beginning, it's terrifying and you kind of do this like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And then you, as you get older and more experienced, you go, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go over there and I'm going to get my money. And that's it. You, you walk over there and you literally, and when I say get in someone's face, I don't mean get in there. I don't mean you're going to go beat them up 
Not that that hasn't happened over the years, but at this point in life, you're, yo, I'm going to email the CEO of that company. He doesn't know what's going on. His project manager is jerking us around because he made the mistake. And you know what? I'm going to talk to him as the owner of the company, the owner of the company. And next thing, there's a dialogue going on. And before you know it, oh, I'm getting paid. And, oh, that guy doesn't work there anymore. Okay. Because you know what? People who've been in business for a long time don't always know what's going on behind the scenes. Fly-by-night companies, well, they're out there. But most decent companies that you're going to work for have good leadership. And sometimes that leadership's not aware of it. They're not aware of what's going on. And it, and it happens in my own organization, too. Don't get me wrong. It happens. But, uh, but yeah, th those are situations where I, I, I can tell you where I saw failure was that close away. But, look, it's, an, it's, a, it's a decision. Do you want to give up? Do you want to quit? And and I, I always go back. There's an old, I remember it was a t-shirt when I was a kid. It said, tough times don't last. Tough people do. You got to remember that. It's going to get better as long as you are doing everything you can to make sure it gets better. It's not going to get better if you just ignore it, but it will get better if you take action. I agree. There should be a level of comfort within your business. And I, those who say that they get comfortable with discomfort. The point of having your own business is that you can afford a level of comfort and taking on the risk. I think it's pretty interesting. Entrepreneurs, we're seen as risk takers. We mm -hmm. take the risk of starting a business, but after we start the business, we don't want to lose what we've created. You take calculated risks. There's a big difference. Yes. It's like walking a tightrope or walking a tightrope with a net under you. Well, what's the point of walking a tight rope with no net under you? Ooh, it's dramatic. Ooh, it looks good. Is somebody going to pay you a couple of million dollars to do it? No, it just looks cool. Okay, so maybe you could walk the tight rope with the net under you and have the camera just pan up so you don't see the net. There's always a way. There's a way around everything. If there's no reward for the risk, you're being reckless. You can always mitigate risk. And if you can't mitigate risk, it's not a good decision. What would your advice be to somebody wanting to start their first business or some of our young entrepreneurial minds out there? So today it's a lot different than it was years ago. Typically, I would say you need money to make money. And that's always going to be a rule. But in this day and age today, we live in the Internet age where you could somehow create an app if that's what your thing is. And you could sell that app and you could pretty much do that without any real cost other than your own time. So again, it depends what your skills are. The first thing I always tell people, stick to what you know. It's it's the key. I think I think I learned that in high school in creative writing where they go write about what you know. And I think it's just it just follows through into business. Stick to what you know. It's like me turning around tomorrow and go, I'm going to become a farmer. I don't know anything about farming, okay? And I don't care if somebody says, there's tons of money to be made in farming. Well, here's the thing about that. And, you know, that, that's the one thing that I can't stand today about career advice. If you're not interested in something, you're never going to learn. I remember my daughter went to an all-girls high school, and the principal was a research scientist. And she would stand up at, like, parent-teacher nights and go, we need more girls in research. And... I would say we need more people in jobs that they're interested in. We can sit here and force people to memorize things for the sake of standardized testing. But if they don't care about it, they never truly learn it, nor are they ever going to want to do it for the rest of their life. So stick to what you like. Find your passion. And I don't care what it is, whatever that passion may be, find how you monetize it. There'll be a way. It may be conventional. It may be unconventional. Look, I took a conventional path. I, I went and opened a business that was it required me to take jobs, hire employees, grow incrementally. There was no going viral overnight and all of a sudden people are going to throw money at me. Not the way I went. Now, by the same token, in the day and age of the Internet, you can come up with something tomorrow that goes viral and a million people see it and everybody wants it. So it's out there. But by the same token, as good as an idea is, you still need money to implement it. So unless you're writing code, creating apps or things of that nature. Now, now don't get me wrong. I know plenty of people who are 
they run websites where what do they do? They sell direct. So so they have a really good website and they do a really good job about advising people about buying X. And all they're really doing is purchasing X and selling it to you for X plus 10%. And they don't spend any money. It's direct sale. They buy it, have it shipped to you, and they make their VIG on the deal. So credit cards, money in, money out. So those are options. That's, those are very real things. For me, I've never been involved with any businesses of that nature, only because, again, I stick to what I know. That's the key. I mean, I, I have three different companies that are underneath very similar awnings. We have DNM Electrical Contracting as our parent company. I have DNM Utility Construction, which just basically has that utility work portion under it. And then I have another company called Northeast Utility Equipment Repair that I have with a partner. And what is that? Well, I have a fleet of trucks. And of those 46 trucks, most of them are bucket trucks and boom trucks that have cranes, and they need specialty repair done. We couldn't find anybody. So what did we do? We hired people to fix our own trucks. And then we said, well, you know what? If there's a need for our trucks to be fixed, there's a need for other people's to get these trucks fixed. So we now fix other people's trucks for different government agencies, municipalities, tree companies, and other electrical contractors. It's a niche market and there's really nobody else doing it. So riches are in the niches. Try to find. If you do the same thing everybody else does, you really only can compete upon service and price. When you do something that no one else does, you create your market, you create the price, you create where that market is. You are the market. So look for those situations. It's not easy, but the fact of the matter is, if you're an entrepreneur, that's what you look for. You look for opportunities and you look at how you can maximize those. Yeah. It's a great tip to master your vertical and then look for horizontal opportunities yeah. still within your niche. Absolutely. You've done that well. Absolutely. So if our listeners wanted to get in touch with you, Doug, or your company for your services, how would they do so? Well, you can always go to our website, www.dmelectrical.com. And, and from there, you can pretty much, you know, it's got contact information, but basically we're, we're out there. We don't typically work with the average people on the street. So our customers tend to be utility developers who are maybe building a solar farm or need to interconnect the solar farm to the utility, things of that nature. A lot of our work comes from referrals because we are on a utilities list of approved contractors. And, and a lot of our other work comes from bidding on just maybe, hey, public projects that everyone else could bid on. So not that we certainly don't want to be interested in other things, but if somebody's got something that along the lines of what we do there, we're certainly interested in talking to them. Well, thank you, Doug, for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. And My thank pleasure. you, everybody, for listening to another episode of Failing to Success. I'm your host, Chad Kalecki with Cosmic Design and Development. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time. Mm -hmm.